We are interviewing today uh, now Dr. Mohamed Omran, who is CEO for the Egypt, Egypt Stock Exchange. Uh, before we actually start the interview, I would like to say a few words about your current position, about your previous positions and your education in general, and then we will be asking you a few questions about uh, the topic that actually you discussed during this uh, conference, the Inter uh, Institute of Cultural Diplomacy conference that we've been attending uh, these three days. Uh, currently, uh, first actually, well, I would like to welcome you here. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to have this interview with you. Uh, currently, you're chairman of the Egyptian Exchange and Professor of Finance at the Arab Academy for Science and Technology. Your previous positions, your previous posts were like a Vice Chairman for Operation of the Insurance Holding Company for one year and a Vice Chairman of the Egyptian Exchange for four years. You have served several years as an economist as both the Arab Monetary Fund in Abu Dhabi and the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. You were an advisor to the Minister of Investment and an acting executive director of the Egyptian Institute of Directors. As far as your education is concerned, you have a master from the Cairo University and PhD in finance from the University of Plymouth, UK. Quite impressive uh, CV. And you have also been received, I have received lots of rewards, like you've been awarded several research grants and prizes, and you were a Fulbright scholar and you have served as an international board member at the privatization agency of Kosovo. So uh, I would like my colleague actually to ask you some questions and then I will ask, also ask you some questions. Good. Okay, let's start. Uh, first question. What impact do you think had Arab Spring from uh, 2010 on the security, peace and reconciliation in 21st century? I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult and tough question actually. You know this Arab Spring, if you would like to call it Arab Spring, started in, in late 2010, beginning of 2011. And it has been like four or five years now. I mean, there is a lot of transitional period. So it is, um, it's very much uh, premature to determine the impact of the Arab, Arab Spring on the peace and the reconciliation in the, in the region because there are many factors and there are many changes mm -hmm. happened there. But what I believe is that uh, at, at a longer, if you allow for a longer period of time, I guess the citizen of this uh, region will understand uh, much better the democracy, will understand how they are be able to support their country, they will understand how they have the voice and accountability. And I guess the, the, the good news is that there are more respect for the human rights, there are more respect for the freedom and democracy, they are more respect for the voice. And now any president or any government, they will understand they are under monitoring of the citizens at large and they have to understand they are working for the sake of the people, not for the sake of their own interests. Thank you. Um, what did the independence of Kosovo bring to its economic development? What do you think? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's again uh, a part of the they are came after a long war happening in the Balkan area and they are trying to support from the international organization including uh, international financial institutions to put the economy again on the track. You understand that in, in Kosovo the unemployment rate is exceeding 25 percent. It's, it's very hard to accommodate these issues but I guess they are trying to put in economic policies to put the country on track and uh, when I was there we were working for helping the country to achieve privatization policies and to sell part of the state assets but I, I think until now they are still in the process of to navigate the right track for the economic development and economic growth but it, still they have some difficulties but I'm sure that by time they will they will try to find the prudential microeconomic policy that would help them to put the the Kosovian economy on track and to in decrease the poverty rate as well as to produce more jobs for the for the citizens at large there in Kosovo. Okay. Well, 
Thank you very much, actually, for this good answer about Kosovo. And the reason we asked this question is because uh, you told us, uh, because you are actually yeah. very much involved in the uh, development of Kosovo. And uh, now, when you reflect back on uh, the moments, uh, on the time when you actually started to work, when you were first engaged in Kosovo, and now, how they have improved, I mean, on a scale oh. from one to five, like? I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it's, there was some sort of time in which things were were going in the in the right direction. We were making big progress in terms of privatization activities, and then you will go in the political conflict, and then the the, the resolve of the parliament, and the new election, and you know, I guess the, in in some cases, especially for the what I can call the young countries in which they do not have a long experience, especially after independence. I mean, it, it, it takes a long time, it takes some time, and you will find that the politician affecting the economic development. And in the last four or five years that I spent in Kosovo, there has been many changes in the government and the parliament, and uh, I guess this is, did not help that much the country to concentrate on the economic policy. And this is what I'm saying, is that you need to have stability first. You need to have a mindset and you need to have a harmony in the government, in the parliament, and the president to make sure that you will have a broadened macroeconomic policies. Uh, I left Kosovo, I guess, like a year, a year ago or a year and a half ago. I did not follow much in about Kosovo, but I, I, I still remembering that at that time when I left, there were some discussion about who will leading the parliament, who will leading the government, and they spent quite a lot of time with that. So just not an advice, but just from the other countries' experience, it's very important to put the right team uh, in place. It's very important to have a harmony among that team, and it's very important to put the, the right economic policies, short, medium, and long-term plans to understand how your economy will move. Yes, uh, thank you. And this actually builds us to the title of your presentation, which was Building Bridges with Bricks from the Walls We Break Down Towards a Secure and Peaceful and a Reconciled 21st Century. So, and in that context, because I was tentatively listening to uh, your presentation, which was very good, I would like actually to ask you on several occasions, you, and I will be more specific, I will direct this issue towards your country, Egypt. Uh, you mentioned like, that uh, economy, eco sustainable economic growth in your country will be much larger. Uh, it, uh, it will go up to certain percentage if you empower more women. Right. And you emphasize that on several times throughout your presentation. Is there any strategy how your government will do it, and or what do you think actually? Uh, what are the ways how to do that, how to empower women? Yeah, it's 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 a very important question, and uh, what I can see from the from the state policies is that they are putting the this issue in the f in the front. And actually, if you look to the recent parliamentary election and the law about the election, you will find the first time ever in Egypt you would expect to have more than eighty women are elected in the parliament. This is the, the biggest number in Egypt history, actually, mm -hmm. and I guess this could be an important element because then the voice of women is not only will be in an official, but it will be inside the parliament itself. Mm -hmm. So the any laws and the regulation that is needed to empower more, more women will be uh, handled and discussed, and there are 80 women behind, behind that to, de to defend their need and to defend themselves. And actually, I can see even in the top level officials in the government, you will find many women that are, uh, are, uh, are recruited by that. For example, the top national security advisor for the president, she is a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, we have like a three, four ministers, they are women. Yes. Uh, now, one of our governors, Alexander, is, and there is an acting go uh, governor, she mm -hmm. is a woman as well. Mm -hmm. Even for me as a chairman of the stock exchange, the top advisor for me, she is a woman, she is not a man. So I guess it is a, a, a perception in the, in the, in the uh, community at large, not only in, at an official level, but unofficial and the private sector and the uh, uh, civil society that women are very important. They are part of the country. They are representing 50% of our population. And we need to empower them not only 
to give them the rights, but also to help the economy at large. Okay, thank you very much. And I think with this, uh, we could actually conclude the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.